Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing asthma and anti-asthmatic drugs. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of studying uh, the mechanism by which histamine and cystinal leukotrienes uh, actually cause contraction in bronchial smooth muscle cells and how that then leads to bronchoconstriction of the airways. Okay, right, so we've seen uh, that uh, histamine and cystinal leukotrienes both act on GQ-11 coupled G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, uh, histamine acts on the H1 receptor and cystinal leukotrienes act on the cystinal leukotriene type 1 receptor. Okay, and these through the GQ-11 cascade lead to a calcium signal within the cytoplasm of the bronchial smooth muscle cell. Okay, and we now want to understand why uh, this calcium signal within the cytoplasm of the bronchial smooth muscle cell can actually cause contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cell. Okay, right, so we've studied the uh, contractile machinery within the bronchial smooth muscle cell. Okay, we've studied the thin filaments here, which are attached to dense bodies and which are oriented along uh, the long axis of the smooth muscle cell. And we've seen that suspended in between uh, the actin filaments or the thin filaments, you have these thick filaments, which are the myosin filaments, which are made out of lots of myosin molecules. Okay, so we've discussed that the two sides of the myosin filament, which interact with actin filaments attached to different dense bodies, will be polarized in different directions. Okay, so the one on this side, which aims to pull these actin filaments in this direction, here, will be polarized in this direction, okay, where the tails of the myosin molecules are uh, oriented in the direction that you want to pull the dense body in, basically, or pull the actin filaments in, and thereby the dense body in. Okay, and then on the opposite side, where you want to pull the thin filaments and the dense body in the opposite direction, the myosin molecules there will be oriented in the opposite direction, okay, again with their tails going in the direction um, in which you want to actually pull uh, the actin filament. Okay, so, basically, if you want to actually get the myosin filaments to start working on the actin filaments and pulling them uh, in these directions, uh, then you have to phosphorylate the regulatory myosin light chain. At least that's the way that contraction is initiated in smooth muscle cells. It's very different in skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. But in smooth muscle cells, contraction is initiated when you phosphorylate the regulatory myosin light chain of these uh, myosin molecules in the myosin filament. Okay, now we're not going to go through the actual mechanism by which myosin molecules actually interact with the actin filament, because all we need to know is how um, contraction is actually initiated, and now we've got that answer. Okay, so to initiate contraction, to get the myosin heads of the myosin filament to actually be able to interact with actin filaments, and therefore to be able to pull on the actin filaments, uh, you need to phosphorylate the regulatory myosin light -like chain. These red proteins are on the myosin heavy chain heads. Okay, right. So what is it then that actually phosphorylates the regulatory myosin light -like chain? Well, basically there is an enzyme which is capable of phosphorylating the myosin light -like chain. Okay, and this is called myosin light -like chain kinase, or MLC kinase. So we know that myosin light -like chain uh, is abbreviated to MLC. Now the K just stands for kinase. Okay, so I'll color in myosin light -like chain kinase here in orange. Okay, now, how then do you activate myosin light -like chain at kinase? Okay, well, we know that somehow a calcium signal needs to activate the myosin light -like chain kinase because we know that that's what our histamine and our cystinal leukotrienes produce. They produce this calcium signal. So now we just want to link these two stories up, basically. We want to see how the calcium signal is actually going to activate myosin light -like chain kinase. Now, it, might, it turns out that myosin light -like chain kinase doesn't have a calcium binding site of its own. So instead, what has to happen is the calcium has to bind to an intermediate protein, and then that intermediate protein then needs to interact with and activate the myosin light -like chain kinase. Okay, and the intermediate protein uh, that's going to do this is a protein called calmodulin. Okay, so I now want to discuss with you uh, calmodulin then. 
Okay, so calmodulin is a protein that has four calcium binding sites, okay, uh, and it has two very different states, okay, so the state where calmodulin does not have any calcium bound to it is called apocalmodulin, and for short, calmodulin is usually abbreviated down to capital C, lowercase a, capital M, okay, so let me draw a picture of apocalmodulin. Okay, so apocalmodulin has these two lobes, and in fact, both forms of calmodulin have these two lobes. Okay, calmodulin more broadly has the two lobes. Okay, one of which is called the N lobe, and the other is called the C lobe. Okay, and both these lobes have two calcium binding sites each. Okay, so the N lobe has two calcium binding sites here, and the C lobe also has two calcium binding sites here. So overall, that's why the calmodulin molecule can bind four calciums. There is then the linker between the two uh, lobes of calmodulin, like so. And in apocalmodulin, where we have no calcium bound to these uh, calcium binding sites yet, the whole molecule is sort of hunched over in this way. The N lobe and the C lobe are sort of folded back towards one another, you can see. Okay, I've tried to show it as though this linker is sort of hunched over. Okay, right. Uh, so that's apocalmodulin, the state where calmodulin doesn't have any calcium bound to it. So that's the state that calmodulin in the cytoplasm will be in before you actually get the calcium signal uh, into the cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, once you do have that calcium signal, once calcium has been released from the endoplasmic reticulum, the calcium will bind to the calmodulin molecule and it will transform the calmodulin molecule into a calcium calmodulin complex, which for short is abbreviated CA2 plus CAN. So let me now show you the picture of a calcium calmodulin complex. Okay, so again, here is the N lobe and here is the C lobe. Okay, and now the molecule's sort of gone straighter. Okay, now the two lobes aren't bent back towards one another. But in contrast to the whole molecule getting straighter, the linker that's between these two lobes goes from being a linear polypeptide, which it was in this picture here, it was linear. It might have been hunched over, but it was a linear polypeptide, to now having an alpha helical structure here. Okay, and this has occurred because uh, two calcium molecules are bound in our two calcium binding sites for each of these uh, lobes here. Okay, so I'll show the calcium ions as these orange dots here. Okay, so this now is our calcium calmodulin complex, and the calcium calmodulin complex can now go off and bind to all sorts of different proteins and affect their function. Okay, so to put this all together then now, Histamine and the cystinal leukotrienes cause this calcium signal in the bronchial smooth muscle cells. The calcium then binds to apocalmodulin molecules, creating calcium calmodulin complexes, and the calcium calmodulin complexes then bind to myosin light chain kinase, which I'll show here. Here's a calcium calmodulin complex, and I'll put the four dots of calcium there, binding to the myosin light chain kinase and they activate the myosin-like chain kinase, which then goes off and phosphorylates regulatory myosin-like chains, and that activates the myosin molecules, okay, in the myosin filaments. And these myosin molecules can now interact with uh, the actin filaments and cause the actin filaments to start moving, basically. Okay, and they're going to be moving the actin filaments towards the center of the myosin filaments. Okay, so these actin filaments here will get moved towards the center of the myosin filaments, i.e. in this direction, and these actin filaments over here will again get moved towards the center of the myosin filaments, but that's in the opposite direction, that's this way. So basically, you're contracting down um, these two dense bodies, you're bringing them closer together. And if you do that for all the dense bodies, then you can imagine that the entire cell is going to start contracting down, basically. Okay, so that's how histamine and cystinyl leukotrienes um, cause contraction of bronchial smooth muscle cells. And you might think, well, was it really necessary to go into that in that sort of detail? But it will help us to understand how the beta-2 agonists uh, which are bronchodilators used in the treatment of asthma, uh, how they actually work. So this will come in useful when we actually want to discuss the pharmacology of the beta-2 agonists later on and how they work to achieve bronchodilation.
Okay, right. Uh, so, we're studying asthmatic attacks. Now, I said asthmatic attacks could be divided up into these two phases. The immediate phase, of which the canonical part was the uh, bronchoconstriction. That's what causes the wheezing and the breathlessness and the coughing and the chest tightness. Okay, that's the main part of the asthmatic attack. But there is also another part of the immediate phase which then leads on to the late phase of the asthmatic attack. Okay, and this other part of the immediate phase is that these same molecules, histamine and cystinyl leukotrienes, released by the mast cells, uh, can also cause inflammation. So let's now discuss this. Okay, so let's move on to inflammation then. Okay, right. So, let me describe then the key components of an inflammatory response. Okay, you're going to bring in basically more components of the innate immune system. Okay, and this is going to be caused by these two mediators that the mast cells have released. Okay, so histamine and uh, the cystinyl leukotrienes. Okay, now, uh, if we want to understand what happens in an inflammatory response, we need to firstly make sure that we're familiar with the microvasculature, okay? So we need to be familiar with the concept of an arteriole, a capillary, and then a venule. Okay, so let me just go over the microcirculation. Okay, so, in fact, I'll get my picture back up of the bronchus. So remember, all of this is happening in the lamina propria. Okay, the mast cells have degranulated and released cystinyl leukotrienes in the lamina propria. Okay, they are now diffusing back and acting on the uh, bronchial smooth muscle cells over here. Okay, but they're also going to be acting on the blood vessels that are in the lamina propria. The lamina propria is, remember, this area of connective tissue, but amongst the connective tissue, you're going to have blood vessels. I might just draw a few little tubes here. Okay, and these blood vessels are going to be servicing the uh, epithelial cells here. Okay, so basically, I'm now discussing the microcirculation in the lamina propria and what effect histamine and the cystinyl leukotrienes are going to have on that microcirculation. Okay, right. So, basically, the microcirculation consists of tiny little arterioles which are about to divide into uh, capillaries. Okay, and these are called terminal arterioles. Okay, now it's important that you put that word terminal because arteriole is this awful word that covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels. Okay, so there are many different sized blood vessels which are all referred to as arterioles. It's everything that's too small to be considered an arteria, sorry, an artery, um, but uh, isn't a capillary. Okay, and it is an arterial arterial blood vessel, okay? Uh, so I'm talking about the absolutely tiny little arterioles, the ones that are just before you start dividing into capillaries, basically. And these are called terminal arterioles. So that's what this little blood vessel here is um, representing. And these are very, very small blood vessels, okay? They have a diameter that will allow a few blood vessel, sorry, blood cells to move through it at once, but they're not that big at all. Okay, right. And now they're going to split into even smaller little blood vessels here. And these are the capillaries, basically. So the terminal arteriole is just before you start to divide into capillaries here. Okay, so these are now the capillaries. And these are really tiny blood vessels. They literally are a single cell thick. Only a single red blood cell at a time can fit through a capillary here, which I'll colour in in turquoise. So these are the capillaries here, okay? And then the capillaries will reconverge to form a venule here, okay? And this is the same, a similar sort of thickness to the arterioles, okay? So the diameter of the venule here is the same sort of thickness as the diameter of the terminal arteriole, okay? But the walls of these venules are much thinner Okay, now again, the term venule covers a huge scope of different sized blood vessels. So to, so to stress that you mean the venules just after the capillaries, you can put post-capillary venule, which means these absolutely tiny little venules that are barely bigger at all than capillaries. Okay, now, 
And let me just then talk about the structure of these different blood vessels. Okay, so terminal arterioles, let's start off by drawing a little picture of a terminal arteriole. Okay, so terminal arterioles, oles, uh, they have a reasonable size diameter. It can fit more than one uh, blood cell in it, okay? And they have a few endothelial cells here lining them, okay? Then underneath the endothelial cells, you'll then have the basement membrane. So we're now looking at the cross-section of a terminal arteriole so that we can understand the structure of the terminal arterial wall. Okay, so we've now drawn the endothelial cells here. They're sitting on a basement membrane, so I'll label this up. So this is a basement membrane, and these here, these are representing the endothelial cells, which I'll just abbreviate down to the ECs. Okay, and then surrounding the basement membrane for these terminal arterioles, you then have, importantly, a smooth muscle cell there. Okay, so in red here, this is representing the smooth muscle cell there. Okay, so this is again rings of smooth muscle cells that when they contract will constrict that blood vessel. And this is the really important thing to understand about uh, terminal arterioles. They are capable of changing the amount of blood that is flowing through them because they can constrict uh, and also dilatate uh, according to the contraction state of these uh, smooth muscle cells. Okay, now let's draw a capillary. A capillary is a tiny little vessel, but I can't really draw it to scale compared to this one because otherwise it literally would be tiny. Okay, so I'll draw it a little bit bigger uh, than it would actually be if we compared it to this one. But you can compare it by the amount of endothelial cells that are surrounding it. So it only really will have one or two endothelial cells making the entire uh, capillary circumference. So you can imagine that in reality it would be something about this size compared to our terminal arteriole. Okay, then again, these uh, endothelial cells are sitting on a basement membrane here. Okay, like so. You've always got a basement membrane underneath the endothelial cells wherever you are, okay? Uh, and then there's nothing after that, okay? Well, actually, there are a few cells called pericytes, which I'll put here, okay? But then they don't form a continuous layer, okay? They're just sort of dotted around the place. So here is a pericyte. Okay, so uh, the wall of capillaries then is much, much thinner than the wall of terminal arterioles, and capillaries don't really have the ability to change the amount of blood that is flowing through them. Okay, so the amount of blood flowing through the capillaries is controlled by the terminal arteriole here. Okay, then let's have a look at the postcapillary venule. Okay, well, this is going to have a similar diameter to the terminal arteriole. Okay, so again, remember that the capillary is not drawn to scale. This is the size the capillary should really be. This now is drawn to scale with the uh, terminal arteriole. Of course, they're not really drawn to scale with how big they would be in your body. Okay, so here we go. They would be little specks as far as how big they are in the actual body. Okay, right. And then they have similar wall structure to the capillaries. They're a similar size to the terminal arteriole, but in really, you can think of them as just big capillaries because their wall literally just consists of endothelial cells sitting on the basement membrane. Okay, and as far as the inflammatory response goes, the uh, response of post-capillary venules is very similar to the response of the capillaries themselves. Okay, so this is the microcirculation then. Blood enters through these terminal arterioles. The terminal arterioles control the amount of blood that's going to go into the capillaries. Okay, the capillaries are the business end. They're where uh, nutrients and waste products are going to exchange between the extracellular fluid and the blood, and then the blood returns into the post-capillary venules. Okay, so what happens in the inflammatory response? Oh, and I should just stress the point. You're going to have all three of these types of blood vessel in the lamina propria of your uh, airways, okay? And when you produce histamine and cystinal leukotrienes uh, because of the mast cells being activated uh, by whatever stimulus it was, whether it was an allergen in atopic asthma or whether it was cold air or uh, noxious gases such as sulfur dioxide and ozone, okay? Uh, what's going to happen is you're going to get the inflammatory response occurring, and this is a response by the microcirculation. Okay, so the inflammatory response is all about the microcirculation. 
basically what you have to think about is the body thinks that something terrible is good, has happened, okay? That something terrible is in the lamina propria. These two molecules here, histamine and cystinyl leukotrienes, they are cause for help, okay? They are cause for help from the mast cells. The mast cells think that there is something incredibly wrong in the lamina propria, okay? And what they're going to do to the microcirculation is change the microcirculation's behavior so that help can come, basically. The microcirculation is going to deliver help to uh, the mast cells in the lamina propria. Okay, now where does this help come from? It comes from the blood. Okay, so in the blood, there are uh, loads of proteins which can attack pathogens. Okay, uh, so we're going to deliver proteins from the blood into the lamina propria to fight the pathogens. In addition, there are loads of white blood cells which can also help to attack pathogens, and we're going to deliver those into this site as well. So that's what's now going to happen. Initially, in the immediate phase of the asthmatic attack, all you're going to have time to get is the uh, proteins coming in from the blood. But in the late phase of an asthmatic attack, what happens is you bring in loads of white blood cells uh, to help, okay? And what ends up happening is this makes the whole chronic inflammation of asthma worse and makes uh, um, more um, airway hyperresponsiveness, basically. It makes the airway hyperresponsiveness situation worse. Okay, so let me describe to you then what the microcirculation's response is going to be to the histamine and cystinyl leukotrienes. Okay, so the two key things that are going to happen are vasodilatation, okay, or vasodilation. And what this means is um, the relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle cells surrounding the terminal arteriole, which is therefore going to lead to more blood flowing through the terminal arteriole and therefore more blood flowing through the capillaries. Okay, so this is going to cause blood flow to go up. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that the amount of help that you can potentially get from the blood is going to be increased. Okay, if you've got more blood flowing through an area, then the potential to remove proteins and uh, leukocytes from that is going to be greater, so you can get more help into your area. Okay, so vasodilation is one of the key things. Okay, in addition, something called endothelial cell, which I'll just abbreviate down to EC, contraction. Okay, so um, what does this mean? Well, basically, this means that the endothelial cells are capable of contracting in a similar way to the way that uh, smooth muscle cells can contract. Okay, so if I draw a little picture of this, initially we have our endothelial cells sitting on uh, the basement membrane like so. Okay, and I should stress that we're now talking about what's uh, something that's going to happen in the capillaries and the post-capillary venules. Vasodilation was something that changed in the terminal arterioles. In the capillaries and the post-capillary venules, you're going to get endothelial cell contraction occurring. Okay, so in the capillaries and post-capillary venules, the wall of the blood vessel literally just consists of the endothelial cells sitting on the basement membrane like so. Now, initially, before the inflammatory response has occurred, the endothelial cells have junctions with their neighbours, basically. And this keeps the uh, wall nice and tight, basically, and stops too much fluid from leaving the blood and going into the extracellular fluid. Now, what's going to happen, basically, in response to the histamine and cystinyl leukotrienes, is you're going to get contraction of these endothelial cells. So let me show this like so. So the endothelial cells are going to contract, basically. They're going to recoil uh, their um, peripheral extensions, basically. And that's going to mean that the junctions between the endothelial cells become much less tight. And you now get gaps being opened up between neighboring endothelial cells. And this then allows fluid from the blood to leave the bloodstream and go into the extracellular fluid. So much more fluid leaves the bloodstream and goes into the extracellular fluid than normal. Okay? And moreover, 
what what can also leave the blood is loads and loads of proteins from the blood. So proteins that would never usually be able to fit out of these capillaries and postcapillary venules. Okay, they'd never be able to squeeze through the little gaps between the endothelial cells. Okay, but now that you've got endothelial cell contraction, they can squeeze through these gaps. Okay, and they can end up leaving the bloodstream and going into the extracellular fluid. Okay, and this accumulated fluid that you get at the site of inflammation, which contains loads of these proteins that are helpful in the innate immune system, uh, is called an inflammatory exudate. So that's a very key word in uh, inflammation. Um, okay, right. So what that will then happen is these proteins are being delivered there to attack pathogens, okay, um, but the overall net effect of this is obviously there's no pathogen, so those proteins will arrive there and all that's going to be achieved is that you're going to get a swelling of the lamina propria, okay, because you've brought in all this fluid and proteins, okay, and that causes uh, an edema basically of the lamina propria, and this does not help at all uh, with the immediate phase of an asthmatic attack, because remember, the bronchoconstriction was bad. The bronchoconstriction has narrowed the airways, okay? Uh, so the bronchial smooth muscle cells have constricted and that's narrowed the airways. But now we're getting inflammation in the lamina propria, which is causing edema there. So the lamina propria is swelling, basically, and that's also going to be pushing the basement membrane and the epithelium inwards and further narrowing the lumen of the airway. So this also actually contributes to the narrowing of the airway. So don't just think about uh, the contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cells. Yes, that is one of the major things that causes the narrowing of the airways. And if you're going to quote just one, that would be the one you'd quote. Uh, but also what contributes in the immediate phase of an asthmatic attack is this edema that you're getting in the lamina propria. Okay, so that's the part that the uh, inflammatory response plays in the immediate phase of an asthmatic attack, that it causes this edema in the lamina propria and that further narrows the airways. Okay, now what I want to talk about is what happens is in the late phase uh, of the asthmatic attacks. Okay, so let's now move on to the late phase of an asthmatic attack. Okay, so we've now had the immediate phase, and I'm going to have to call it there for this video because this pen is going. Okay, we'll continue this discussion in the next video.